O nosso próximo painel é Capitalismo não é o problema, é a solução, com o historiador alemão Rainer Zittelmann. É, eu li o livro dele ontem, extremamente interessante, vale muito a pena a gente prestar atenção nessa apresentação. Rainer, por favor. I love capitalism. And if you ask me why, I could speak hours about this topic. Sometimes I speak hours about this topic, but sometimes I have only 30 seconds. For example, in a TV interview, then people ask me, you have this T-shirt, I have a T-shirt with I love capitalism. Why do you wear this T-shirt? And if I have only 30 seconds time, then I tell people, 200 years ago, more than 90% of the worldwide population lived in extreme poverty, 90%. Today, it's less than 10%. And what's even more important, half of this reduction happened over the last 35 years. This is great news. For a lot of people, they never heard about it. And so I'm very grateful to, to Salin that he mentioned the word capitalism in his opening statement, I think 10 or 20 times, because four weeks ago, I was also at a libertarian conference, and all over the day, I heard the word capitalism not only once. Why? Because, and this is also something that Salin has uh, mentioned, capitalism has a negative image for a lot of people. You know, of course. And what I did now, I commissioned a poll in 19 countries, but it will be much more. You are the first to get the result here in Brazil, because this is the content of my next book that will be published only in a couple of months but I will present some of the results of this poll. Of course, there were some other polls before about the image of capitalism. But in most cases, they asked only one question, as for example, do you like capitalism or not? But I think this is not enough, because you know, even the word capitalism has a negative connotation for a lot of people. It's a dirty word for them. And I wanted to find out how much has it to do it with the word and how much with what the word actually means. And so we presented to our respondents in our survey not only one question, but 34 statements. 34 statements. And I commissioned the poll. It was conducted by one of the leading polling institutes of the world, Ipsos Mori. We asked people in these countries, but it will be much more countries. And and the first six statements were without using the word capitalism. Because, as I mentioned before, for a lot of people, capitalism is a bad word. And so we didn't mention the word capitalism. We asked questions as, for example, or we confronted our respondents with statements as, for example, the state should set the prices for rent and food and should set minimum and maximum wages, otherwise it becomes unfair, socially unfair. Someone who supports a statement as this is anti-free market. Or on the other hand, statement as, I'm for an economic system in which the state sets the rules, but ideally does not interfere otherwise. So this is someone who's pro-market. And the result, and, and then we calculated the average percentage of pro-market and anti-market statements and calculated something that we called the pro- and anti-capitalism coefficient. You see here the result. Very interesting. The higher the number is, the more pro-capitalist are people in the country. You see there at the top, Poland. Poland, followed by then the United States, 
Czech Republic, South Korea, Japan. And then this was a surprise for me, Argentina. Argentina is number seven from pro-capitalist attitude. This was great news for me, but I was a little bit surprised and I had doubts, but the questioner was the same in all of these countries. I've been 10 days now in Argentina, and it was great because I, on the one hand, I saw so much poverty, on the other hand, I saw poor people, young people, who told me capitalism is not the problem, it's a solution. And I saw a very strong libertarian movement there in Argentina. And so now I understand why it's number seven there. But on the other hand, do you see Chile there? Chile, one of the countries, the most anti-capitalist countries, our survey. We did this poll two months before the elections, and so I was not surprised about the outcome of the elections. Because in spite of the fact that Chile was so successful with capitalism in the last decades, people are much better off in Chile and in most of the other countries in Latin America. But the attitude of the people today, as you see in this poll, is anti-capitalist. So you see here at the end, countries as France. So these were the results when we didn't use the word capitalism. We only described what it is. But then we asked a lot of other questions. The first one was an association test. We asked people, what do you think when you hear the word capitalism? Do you think about prosperity, or do you think about corruption? Do you think about freedom, or negative and positive words? And after this, again, we calculated the average percentage of positive and negative answers, and we came out to our anti- and pro-capitalism coefficient. But this time we used the word capitalism. And then we had 18 other questions. For example, capitalism is to blame for hunger, for poverty, for climate change, of course, for all negative things in the world, even for my individual problems, of course. Capitalism is to blame for everything. On the other hand, we had positive statements, as capitalism means economic freedom. And by the way, this is it, in my next book. I will refute all these prejudices and all these myths about capitalism. I will have for every of the statements, these negative statements, one chapter. For example, first chapter, capitalism is uh, to blame for hunger and poverty. Next chapter, capitalism is to blame for inequality. Capitalism is to blame for climate change. Capitalism is to blame for monopolies, and, and, and. This will be my next book. So we had 18 of these questions or statements, and then again, we calculated this pro- and anti-capitalism coefficient. Here you see the result is similar but not identical, because now this is the overall coefficients of attitudes toward capitalism. When we used the word capitalism and when we didn't use it. So you see, it's a little bit different. So Argentina belongs now what we call the neutral, the neutral countries. And Chile is a little bit better, but also anti-capitalist. You see here the, the, bright, uh, the bright bars on the left hand. These are the pro-capitalist countries and the dark bars are the anti-capitalist countries. And so we even could calculate the effect of using the word capitalism. You see, in most of the countries, um, the people were much more pro-capitalism when we didn't use the word. But don't forget, this is a good news, of course, but on the other hand, even if we didn't use it, remember the first graph, even then the majority of people is against capitalism in most of these countries. So unfortunately, it's not only the word, it's what the word stands for. But in Chile, you see here, it made not a difference. Whether we use the word capitalism or whether we don't use the word capitalism, people in Chile today, unfortunately, in spite of all the good things that capitalism did for Chile, are against capitalism. 
This is one of my favorite things. During the corona crisis, there was a lot of talk about conspiracy theories. You know, these conspiracy theories, some of them are all of them very crazy. For example, this QAnon people, you know them, in the United States, who believe in crazy things. And usually it's linked with right-wing thinking. I, I read a lot of books about conspiracy theories, and all the examples were right-wing thinking. But I had another hypothesis. My hypothesis was that anti-capitalists are conspiracy theorists. Anti-capitalists are conspiracy theorists. So, how to prove this hypothesis in a scientific way? In addition to all these questions about capitalism, we, add, we confronted our respondents with two typical statements for conspiracy theorists. One statement was, politicians decide almost nothing, they are only puppets from forces in the background. And the other statement was, that you can only understand politics if you know that all this happens according to a secret plan that most people do not know. And so we could find out who is a conspiracy theorist and who not. And then we could link this with the answers to our questions about capitalism. And here, if you look at this graph, don't compare the countries. This is not so important. You should compare the left the left bright bar with the right, uh, the left dark bar with the right bright bar. Here, for example, let's take the example here, Chile. You see, in each of these countries, anti-capitalists tend more to be conspiracy theorists than pro-capitalists. So this is a proof for the fact that anti-capitalists are in fact conspiracy theories. And it's true for all of these 19 countries. Even if it would have been only maybe 13 or, or 12 countries and the others, it would prove my hypothesis. But it was true in all of these 19 countries that anti-capitalists are conspiracy theorists. So this is another research. I've done it before. I wrote another book. The title of the book is The Rich in Public Opinion. It was uh, published by Cato Institute. It's also published in a lot of other languages, for example, in Spanish, not in, uh, not in Portuguese today. And this was about envy. It, it was about stereotypes and prejudice against rich people. There are a lot of books, prejudice against gay people, prejudice against black people, prejudice against yes, uh, Jewish people, overweighted people, but there was not one single book about prejudice and stereotypes against rich people. And so I wrote the first book about this. And this is also based on a poll. We did this poll not in 19, but so far in 11 countries, but I will do it in more countries. And we wanted to find out how envious are people in different countries. Envy against rich people. And you can't ask people, are you envious or not? If I would ask you, I'm not envious, these are the others. You have to ask other questions, as for example, this statement, I'm in favor of increasing taxes for millionaires, uh, even if I have no personal advantage. Or I'm in favor of drastically reducing manager salaries and distribute it more evenly among the employees, even if everyone gets only $2 more. Or we had one schadenfreude question. If I hear that a millionaire loses a lot of money through to a risky business, I think this serves him right. By the way, Germany was the only country where there were so much people in uh, pro this schadenfreude statement. That's the reason why the word uh, comes from German in English. So you see here, most envious people are in France, followed by Germany, but it's very different in countries as Japan or South Korea and in Asian countries. People have a different attitude towards rich people. I've been in South Korea, I've been in China, I've been in uh, Vietnam, and people think much different about rich people. They see them more as role models than as scapegoats. So these were some of the results from my next book, but I will tell you only a little bit about this book that is published in Portuguese. 
uh, capitalism is not the problem, but the solution. And it starts with a chapter about China, Mao Zedong. It starts with a great leap forward, the biggest socialist experiment in history. 45 million people died as a result of the biggest socialist experiment in history. And I have my lectures all over the world, and I ask people, have you heard about this at school? Have your teacher told you about this biggest socialist experiment? Maybe I can ask you, who have heard at school about this great leap forward socialist experiment where 45 million people died? Please, hands up. I see no one, and I think it's a shame. People are told at school so much about the evils of capitalism, but no one hears about these crimes of socialism and communism. And, you know, after Mao's death, Deng Xiaoping started with these economic reforms, introducing private property, more elements of free market in China. And the result is amazing. Of course, I don't like the political system in China. It's a dictatorship, no freedom of speech, no freedom of press. And of course, it's not a pure capitalist country, but there is no pure capitalist country all over the world. It's a mixed system as every other system. But you see what happens only because of introduction of elements of free market, private property. The percentage of people who lived in extreme poverty in China, 1981, was 88%. 88%. Today it's less than 1%, according to official data of World Bank. So this is the result of capitalism. And on the other hand, the number of billionaires increased. In Mao times, there was not a single billionaire. Maybe Mao was a millionaire, but there was not a single billionaire. Today you have 700 billionaires in China, so much as in the United States, and today there are, you, you have more billionaires living in Beijing than in Manhattan, what a lot of people don't know. So why is this so important? Why is this so important? Because this proves that zero-sum thinking is wrong. In the panel before, someone mentioned zero-sum thinking. Zero-sum thinking means that rich people become only rich because they take it away from the poor. This is a core belief of all socialists. Socialists are zero-sum thinkers. They believe in this. And it's totally wrong, of course, because if it would be right, if it would be right, how to explain these numbers? It's not logical. So you see, zero-sum thinking is wrong, and this is also, I don't have to look only to China. In 2000, we had 500 billionaires in the world. Today, we have 2,800. But the rate of people living in extreme poverty in 2000 was 24%. Today, it's less than 10%. So zero-sum thinking is wrong. This is very important to understand. And you see here the facts. If I want to explain economic progress or economic decline in country, I use its test tube theory. In fact, it's not a theory, it's more a metaphor. Imagine a test tube with two ingredients, market and state, capitalism and socialism. And then you see what happens if you give more market in the test tube. You have seen it in China. You have seen it in Chile in the last decades. You have seen it in Poland. You have seen it in South Korea. South Korea, I've been there. In the 60s, it was one of the poorest countries in the world, as poor as most countries in Africa. Why were they so successful? Capitalism. So this is what happens if you give more market in the test tube, or Czech Republic, so many examples. On the other hand, what happens if you give more state in the test tube? You saw it in Venezuela. Venezuela, in the 1907, 
one of the 20 richest countries in the world. One of the 20 richest countries in the world. Then they started with so much regulation, they had the worst labor market regulation in the world. They started with this in the 70s, 80s, and the situation became worse. And then you know what happened? 1999, people voted for Hugo Chavez. And all the leftist intellectuals all over the world, they were so enthusiastic. They called it the socialism in 21st century. Because, you know, North Korea was not the perfect example for socialism. But now they had another example for socialism. Even in my country, Germany, the leader of the left party, the chairwoman, they recommended to us in Germany we could should learn a little bit from Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Fortunately, we did not so far. Hopefully, we will not. So, if you want to understand the development in the country, it's very easy. It's not only about the absolute relationship between market and state, but it's about the change. Give more state or give more market in the test tube. And, but for socialists, it's no argument. What did they tell us when socialism fails? They tell us, no, no, this wasn't true socialism. But now I have the idea how it can work. They tell us that 100 years. But all socialist experiments in the last 100 years failed without any exception. And I give you an example. Imagine a housewife bakes a cake. And then she invites guests next Saturday. But what happens? The guests get sick. To be honest, they have to warm it. So next Saturday, she invites again the guests. She understood something was not perfect with the recipe. I have to make some slight modifications. But what happens? Again, guests get sick, have to warm it. So she understood, okay, something wasn't true, wasn't correct with the recipe last Saturday and the Saturday before. So she bakes again a cake with, again, slight modification. Again, guests get sick and they have to warm it. And then she does this 24 times, again, time and again, time and again. Now you will say, Mr. Sittman, this is crazy. There is no housewife in the world who is so crazy to do this. And you are right. There is no housewife in the world. But this is exactly what socialists did. They tried it in so many, in so many ways. In China in another way than in the Soviet Union. In North Korea in another way than in East Germany. And in, even with so-called democratic socialism as in the 70s in the, UK, uh, in the UK or in Sweden. I have also a chapter in my book about the so-called democratic socialism. So they tried it in so many ways, but it failed time and again without any exception. But the trick of the socialists is, and this is something Axel Kaiser spoke, he spoke about utopia. What is the trick? In my book, I compare things that you can compare. For example, China in Mao's time, China today. Or I compare Chile and Venezuela. I compare, for example, East and West Germany, North and South Korea. By the way, people flee always from socialism to capitalism, from North Korea to South Korea, or from East Germany to West Germany, or from Cuba to Miami. No one goes from Miami to Cuba, maybe for two weeks vacation, but not to live there. And no one will say, I'm, I'm going to go from South Korea to North Korea. But socialists, anti-capitalists, what they do, they don't compare real life capitalism with socialism. They compare it with a book, with a theory, with a utopia. And it's the same way. Let's give me an example. Are you married? Not yet. Not yet. Not you? I'm on the market. Okay. Someone married? You? Okay. Are you happy with your marriage? Yeah. Okay. So. So. 
<laughs> but would you be surprised when you come home this evening and your wife starts, we have to speak, to talk about something, and it's divorce. Why? Why? Because she started to read this romantic love novels, how true love should be in the book, and then she compares your real-life marriage with the book. We would say it's not really fair. Please compare it with our friends, not with this book. But this is what socialists do. They compare it with a book, with a theory. And so I don't discuss about a theory. I discuss about history. I'm a historian. This is what my book is about. This book here, capitalism is not the problem, but the solution. I don't compare theory with reality, but I compare things that you can compare. And then my result is very easy. I love capitalism. And capitalism is not a problem, but capitalism is a solution. Thank you. Is there any time for questions, or should we go to the next? Uh, one, question. one question, okay. Who's the one? Who's the bold one <laughs> who's going to, to make one, cash, one single question? Nobody? Oh, boy. I, I think everybody's tired about... Tired from my presentation? Hopefully no, not. No, it's the, the whole day. <laughs> you know? But uh, let, Long me, day. let me... Let me... Okay, someone... Oh, there is one. We have a candidate there. Okay, go ahead. It's just a curiosity. Uh, how did you change from being a socialist to write a book on Okay, she's true. I was a socialist, not only a socialist, I was hardcore Maoist, but a long time ago, 50 years ago, when I was, I was very early interested in politics. With 13 years, I founded a so-called red cell at my school, and even I had my own newspaper, Red Banner. And I read all this, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin. My, my parents were left, but not far left. How to shock them? Of, of course, I could be very right-wing, but I did something else. I had a big poster of Joseph Stalin in my room there. Long live dictatorship of proletariat. This was enough to shock my father, who was not left lady, but so. It took a time. It's not you wake up early in the morning and then next day wears the I love capitalism t-shirt, but it was like 10 years, maybe in the beginning of the 20s. I studied history, I studied politics, and I wrote my first doctoral, you know, I have two PhDs, and the first one was about Hitler, uh, Hitler about his economic views, and I saw that Marxist fascism theory is totally wrong. By the way, this book is published some months ago in a new edition with a preface. It's called Hitler's National Socialism. Hitler's National Socialism to prove why Hitler was much more anti-capitalist socialist. And so these were some insights that I had. Thank you for the question. Okay, uh, one more question for the congressman, Marcel van Hatzen. And I'm not professor. I have two PhDs, but not professor. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you came with theory, with data, with um, uh, history, well, with science. So what is your explanation to so many scientists or uh, academics that are still on the left? So, very good question. There's a whole chapter, chapter 10 in my book. This is the best chapter in the book. Why intellectuals don't like capitalism? Do I have half hour more to give an answer? Yeah, unfortunately, no. Do, do I have two minutes more or no? Oh, two minutes. Two okay. minutes, okay. It's, it's really hard to explain because it's crazy, of course. But I come from an academic family. And in this family, it was who has read the more books well, should be up. So the more books you read and the better you were at academics. So, and so... A lot of intellectuals, they think this way. They, don't, they, they only understand academic learning, academic wisdom. You know, in psychology, we distinguish between, between explicit learning and implicit learning. 
Implicit learning is like learning by doing. This is for entrepreneurs very important. Explicit, explicit learning is book wisdom. It's both important, but intellectuals, they only understand explicit knowledge, book wisdom. And then they learn later in life that it's not this way how many books you read and the more money you have. And then they see, oh, there's a former school neighbor and he has read not as far as many books as I, but now he has the bigger house, the better car, and what is worse, the more prettier wife. And then he says, okay, market has failed. Because if market was correct, I should be there with a you know, prettier wife, bigger house, better car. It's a little bit too easy, so, but read the book, Tap the Chen, Why Intellectuals Don't Like Capitalism. So, thanks again. Thank you.